Um, and Kristen, please, at any time, let me know when it comes through. So thank you all so much. I can actually talk uh, <laughs> the entirety of this time without images, but I'd rather have the images. Um, what motivated me, I think like any grad student at the time, I was in a PhD program and unlike most of my cohort members, I knew I wanted to write about enslaved women, but I wasn't quite sure. And so it wasn't until my third year in the program where I read uh, a book called Gender Talk by Janetta Cole, who is a famed anthropologist and was college president of Spelman and Bennett College, the two uh, colleges for black women in the country and um, Beverly Guy Scheftel. And in the book, there were maybe two or three sentences about this guy named James Marion Sims. I'd never heard of him in my life called the father of American gynecology. And it talked about uh, his experimental work on enslaved women. This was 2005. And up until that point, most folk knew about experimental medicine with the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, but that was it. This was before Rebecca Sloots's The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And so I was blown away uh, knowing this history and I wanted to know more. And so as I started to do more research about James Marion Sims, I had this idea, what if I wrote a history of slavery and a history of medicine that centered the patients? Right, so this is 2005. I graduated in 2008, and the book takes a very long time to come. By the time the book is published, there is considerable interest in the topic because I was living in New York City at the time. And in living in New York, I'll tell you if you will remember in 2017, around the country, there had been a lot of controversy by young college students, primarily in the South to remove statues of Confederate generals. The, the North thought that they were safe. Oh, we don't have any Confederate generals, <laughs> no, no commemoration. However, in Central Park, here was this statue in the easternmost part of the park of James Marion Sims. And ever since 2008, there had been a concerted effort by a black and brown activist to have that statue removed. And so, it was really during this time that people started to pay attention um, to the history of medicine. They started to pay attention to this man named James Marion Sims. And it was really at that moment where I was confronted with how do I present a history of medicine where people understand the landscape of the antebellum era, they understand slavery, but also I wanted to dismantle the ways that history was being written, particularly by journalists in this very, simplistic either or way. Was Sims a monster or was he a savior? And I wanted to say, as historians, we are supposed to provide context. That's what I do as a, as a professor. And so there are lots of misinformation. Um, I wanna kind of stop here to see, Kristen, did you receive the, the PowerPoint? Unfortunately, I did not. Um, my email does seem to be working and getting other things in, so. Um, okay. I just talked with IT. We didn't have any quick solutions. If, okay. Do you want to try so, one more time quickly? Yes. Um, so, so, if, if there's a lot of images in it, maybe it's too big. But um, No, it shouldn't be. It's just a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Um, this is Dr. Hunter. It looks like you've been made a co-host, so you should be able to share your slides now. If you're um, yeah. Unfortunately, it's still telling me the open system preferences. Um, this is a little different. I just did a grand rounds for the University of Chicago Monday, and it's just a little different. It looks like your system is a bit more advanced. So I'm going to open, uh, open systems preferences. Hold on one moment. And let's see here. All right. What I may have to do, if you all will allow, it will take 30 seconds. I have to quit in order for it to record. And that's how we'll, I think it will allow me to share the so story. We're happy to allow that. We, we're really okay. looking forward to it here. Okay. It'll take 30 seconds. We've learned we now need to okay. check with people ahead of time. <laughs>
Guess what? I can share it. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. For you. you are welcome. Um, yeah, your system is a don't don't let the folk at the University of Chicago know, but your but your system's a little bit more <laughs> advanced. All right. So um, this is a copy, an image of the book. And as I said, I was confronted with um, contesting the Sims legacy. So this is also an older image of uh, Sims's statue in Central Park. It was the first statue dedicated to uh, an American in the park. And what happened, what really changed my life from being a kind of unknown assistant professor in African-American history at Queens College in New York was this photo. Um, I started to get a lot of calls August 17th, 2017. And people were saying, hey, you didn't tell me organize a protest. And I'm like, what in the world are you talking about? Well, an uh, image went viral of four members of New York's Black, uh, Black Youth Project 100. And they staged an artistic political protest to have Sims' statue removed. And as we know, with a lot of Generation Z folk, uh, when they take these kinds of images and they put it on Twitter or social media, it goes viral. And there was really now a lot of focused attention and a kind of hyper visibility of, of the Sims image, um, a Sims legacy, excuse me, in New York. And so I remember I, I was like, I don't I don't even know this group. What are you talking about? My book hasn't come out yet. Um, and then when I did a little research and met the woman who organized it, who's in the turban, Jewel Cadet, I later found that I wouldn't have been able to join the BYP 100 if I wanted to, because the age of cutoff is 30 and that boat has sailed many times before. So what it does for me is it literally changes the trajectory of how I wanted to do public interfacing history. And it created an opportunity for me as a historian to be able to, as I said, you know, really talk about a lot of the fictions that arose around uh, racial science during the time, James Marion Sims, but also to help fill in the gaps where uh, I knew a lot of Americans didn't really understand um, the, the world in, or at least America in the 19th century. And so what happened was the statue was removed uh, a little less than a year later. On April 17th, once again, I am, um, <laughs> I am really surprised. I'm getting a lot of messages. People are contacting me hey, do you know what's going on? And I'm like, yeah, it's my birthday. And wouldn't you know, the Sim statue was removed on my birthday. And it was to be taken to uh, his burial plot in Brooklyn. And the residents in that neighborhood did not want the Sim statue placed at his gravesite. And so now it is sitting in storage in New York. But what it allowed me to do was to answer a question that I posed earlier as I was giving some context. I really wanted us to pivot the conversation from whether Sims was a savior of women or a medical monster, um, which was actually the title of a front page paper uh, in 2017, to really thinking about right, how slavery was linked to the advancement of obstetrics and gynecology. And so I wanted to also take away this notion of a historical boogeyman. And it really is the fault, I think, of earlier historians who, who began to formalize this as a branch of study in the 1800s. That kind of early history dealt with big men and big women, right? The kind of top-down history where you knew great men, you learned dates, but there was not a lot of context. And so what I wanted to do was say, let's take, let's kind of remove ourselves from thinking about either or, and we can think about both and. Right, because you you tend to have a greater um, way of thinking critically when there's a both and binary that's applied rather than either or. And so, in my first chapter, what I really wanted to do was give space to the ways that Sims inherits a cultural legacy and practice around the treatment of Black women and enslaved women. And so I started with this critical question, was Sims exceptional in his treatment of enslaved women? Because in the many talks that I've done and the conversations that I've had with people, they often said, Sims was the one who said Black people didn't experience pain. I'm like, no, he didn't. That already existed. Sims butchered 
the reproductive parts of enslaved women because he was a monster. And I'm like, well, human beings aren't monsters, even if they do monstrous things. So why don't we unpack what this means? Sims was a slave owner. And Sims was a slave owning physician. A slave owning physician who leases or rents women, because that's the thing, Sims had to lease and rent these women from their owners, would not enter into a legal agreement where he would intentionally destroy property. But beyond that, the engine of United States slavery was perpetuated upon having healthy wounds of enslaved women. And so I'll talk about that later. And so what I really wanted to do was not to defend Sims because Sims does not need my defending or anybody else's, but to really say he is one of a number of folk who helped to create the building blocks of American modern, modern gynecology. And he did so because of access to this very vulnerable population that slavery unfortunately provided. And so I began with Georges Cuvier, who was a natural historian and scientist. Uh, he did most of his work in the 18th century, but I'm interested in him in his work in the early 19th century and the ways that he treated a South African born woman named Sarki Bartman that I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, and he dissects her cadaver in 1813 after her death. And even though we tend to think about Sarki Bartman or as she was derisively called the Hottentot Venus because of the kind of circus like treatment she received in her life in Europe, I'm much more interested about how this historian, this scientist wrote about, treated and treated this black woman as an owned person and what this does for the um, medical world in the Atlantic, uh, in the Atlantic world, right? And especially in the 19th century. And then I talk about Ephraim McDowell, who I'll also discuss, who was known as the father of the ovariotomy, um, another US born slave owning physician right, who experiments largely on enslaved women. John Peter Matar, most folk don't know his name, but he was the one who helped to pioneer the vesicovaginal fistula surgery or obstetrical fistula surgery that Sims becomes known for. And he did this a decade before Sims and published on it. Um, Francois-Marie Pavoche, the father of the C-section, like Cuvier, he was uh, French born. He does most of his experimental work uh, in Haiti in the 18th century, up until the end of the uh, Haitian Revolution, which is 1804, on enslaved women, right? Performing abdominal incisions to remove their, their babies. And most of these women die, as you can imagine. Um, once the Haitian Revolution kicks off and French born folk, they have to get out of Dodge, where does he go? To another former French colony this time a part of the United States, Louisiana. And he continues to work on enslaved women experimentally trying to perfect the C-section. And so I present this, this kind of uh, genealogy of these men to show that this had literally been ongoing since the 18th century in the Atlantic world context. And when Sims enters into medical school, this is knowledge that has already been documented. And these are practices that he literally inherits. So I like to begin with Sarti Bartman. This is an illustration from a French publication in the early 19th century. She was a Khoi Khoi woman born in South Africa. That was her uh, ethnic group. And at the age of 17, her owner sells her to his brother and his brother's English partner. Now, often in political discourse, you'll often hear that folk like me who are academics are called kind of leftist indoctrinationists of America's youth. And we are revisionist historians. Well, I think in this case, some history needs to be revised because it was inaccurate. And so the original story was Sarhi Bartman looking for fame leaves uh, South Africa to become famous in England. And when you look at the stats, she's 17, she is a house slave, she doesn't speak English, South Africa is on the Indian Ocean, she doesn't know that the Atlantic Ocean exists. Why would she leave everything that she knows, her family, her fiance, to go on a ship to a place in the world that she doesn't know exists, to be around people where she doesn't speak the language? Essentially, she is sold because her former owner's brother and his business partner are captivated 
not by her, her domestic skills. They're captivated because she has a big butt. And in fact, doctors even pathologize Bartman's, uh, the size of her behind by calling it steatopegia, an enlargement of the buttocks. I lived in South Africa for a, a few months, uh, a few years ago, and trust me, she does not have a shape that is any different than any of the women who lived in the region where she's from, right? And so here she is made to become a circus freak essentially because she has large buttocks. After about three years in England, she's then sold to a zookeeper in France. And this is where Cuvier and the National Museum of uh, Paris enter into the picture. They are um, really astounded by this woman and Cuvier is trying to figure out if she is somehow the missing link between primates and humans. And I think that this is also best illustrated um, through, this uh, through this picture because you literally see these, these um, French uh, military men, right? These soldiers and one is behind her, right? Trying to reach for her buttocks. Another uh, soldier is trying to look beneath the covering of her genitalia. You see a woman dressed in finery, staring at her knees, right? Hot and tots, a very derisive name for uh, South Africans. We're supposed to have knock knees. Um, you see another man, and it's to my right in the far corner, literally tightening the gaze of his lens, right? Of the monocle that he has. And so there is a way that Cuvier is just as... Um, you know, he he is attracted to what this specimen might reveal, but also repulsed by her as well. And he does everything in his power uh, in the museum as a scientist to try to examine her body, largely to see if she has a hooded labia, right? Some, a hot and tot hooded labia. Well, uh, Bartman dies at the age of 25, lives a very short life. She's had a difficult life. And Cuvier is finally allowed to examine her and removes her from the menagerie. And that's where plants and animals are kept and puts her on the examination table. And guess what he finds? The Bartman is like any other human being. But what he does that literally lays a template for the, the Atlantic world and medical practitioners to follow, he removes her brain, preserves it, puts it in a bell jar removes her genitalia, preserves it, puts it in a bell jar, has her skeleton on display in the museum. Uh, and they are on display until 1974 in the Paris Museum until the museum loses her genitalia and her brain. And this shows that even in the afterlife of someone who was owned, right, there's value in the body parts. Right? So with enslaved people, there's always an economic value, but there's even value in the body parts to somehow teach. And also this display of the body in life and even after life, right? That Black women somehow have a natural kind of immodesty about their bodies. And so what this does is creates a space for someone like Ephraim McDowell to begin his experimental work on enslaved women. Uh, I know that we our time is going by quickly because of the delay, so I'll just kind of briefly say that Ephraim McDowell, Virginia-born, uh, moves to Kentucky as a child. He encounters a white woman uh, during his time in Kentucky as a, a doctor, and she comes in complaining that her stomach is distended. She's experiencing a lot of abdominal pain, and this is during the time when Doc, male doctors are not supposed to physically examine women. And so he asks her permission to examine her. She uh, allows him that. And he discovers that she, in fact, he says, I think you might have an ovarian tumor. I'll need to, uh, to, to operate. This is 1809. Operations are exceedingly rare, and especially operations that are abdominal-based never happened because the outcome is fatal. The patient is going to die. And so the town found, finds out that he wants to operate on Mrs. Todd Crawford. And they are outraged. Ephra McDowell, some years before, had grave robbed uh, the, the uh, recently expired body of an enslaved man. 
when he was a medical apprentice. And so he had had, a, a, you know, not a lot of trust by his community members. So he sneaks Mrs. Todd Crawford in with the help of her husband on the morning of uh, December 25th, Christmas morning in 1809, performs the surgery. Amazingly, she lives. This is 1809. The reason I keep report, uh, saying that date, it becomes very important for the next part of this. 1808 in the U.S. Constitution bans the international slave trade. So what this means for the United States, you can no longer have Africans imported into the United States. There is now a concerted effort by the country and also slave owners to increase the natural rate, or as they would write back then, the natural increase of the Negro slave. And so there is really a concern by doctors, especially how do we help to create um, you know, the best reproductive abilities and health for enslaved women. And it wasn't because of benevolence or magnanimity. It was because of the cost benefit analysis, right? Um, how in the world do we increase our rates since we no longer have bodies coming in across the, the ocean? So Ephraim McDowell, he literally collects cases in his little town of Danbury, Connecticut. He gets five cases of negresses, as he called them, he gets to experimenting over a number of years. And he operates on these women, I think four of whom were enslaved. One might have been a free person of color, as they were called then. And one of his patients dies. Nine years later, in 1817, he publishes, article, he publishes his article. One would think, okay, the U.S. is on the map, and he is derided. And in fact, one of the, uh, the most Vocal critics is a Dr. Johnson who writes in The Lancet in England that, and I'm paraphrasing here, of course, McDowell as a backwoods frontiers doctor would choose a, a negresses because they bear pain and cutting with the impunity of dogs and rabbits. And so I often tell audiences, this is 1817. J uh, uh, um, James Marion Sims was still young right? He was not in anybody's medical school. He was not a doctor. But this idea that Black women, right, had ease in childbirth, didn't experience pain, was already in existence, right? So this is Ephraim McDowell. John Peter Matauer, uh performs experimental surgery in the 1830s on an enslaved woman suffering from obstetrical fistula surgery, who's around in her late teens or early 20s, and a white woman who's suffering from the same condition. And he uses a silk suture method to repair the fistula. The white woman is allowed to heal, and he writes that she is cured. The enslaved woman isn't. And after eight rounds, right, he talks about these eight rounds over a number of years, this enslaved woman still isn't cured. And in the article that he publishes in the American Journal of Medical Sciences, he writes, and it really is, I think, a really chilling, but also honest, frustrating sentence. He says the patient could have been healed had she stopped engaging in sexual intercourse. Here's a Virginia-born slave-owning physician who understands the state of slavery. He knows that as much as she had no authority to say whether he could experimentally operate on her or not, an enslaved woman also doesn't own her person. Legally, slaves are considered chattel or movable property. How in the world would she be able to stop engaging in sexual intercourse? And so what this also teaches us is, although women uh, existed in a very degraded, um, a, a degraded role, right, in society during this time, when you think about, and I use modern terminology, the social determinants, of the time period, slavery, labor, all of those kinds of things, right? It affects this black woman's ability to be healed. And then we move on to the person that most people have heard of, James Marion Sims, known as the father of American gynecology. And he was given that moniker after his death by his colleagues. And he enters the books uh, essentially because of his 1852 article on vesicle vaginal fistula, which was based on the experimental work one eight five eight five zero two zero zero. Okay, I think someone might be unmuted. Yeah, I'm please mute anyone who's not talking. Okay. 
<laughs> and so anyway, he enters the history books by performing this experimental surgery on enslaved women over a nearly five year process. Lots of things had been said, right? That he intentionally drugged his patients with opium. Uh, with opium. And I had to say, no, nope, not true. When you are suturing patients, particularly in the vaginal or anal area, you don't want those sutures to break. And so uh, opium causes uh, constipation, right? They said, why didn't he give them anesthesia? Anesthesia was already developed during this time and it was rarely used in the 1840s. Anesthesia as a branch of medicine, as many of you know, didn't exist. And so what is the best way for a doctor to kill a patient? Put them in twilight sleep, as it was called particularly when you don't know dosages and those kinds of things. And so doctors during this time, and this is the 18, uh, mid 1840s to the late uh, 1840s, are really proud of their dexterity and their skill. And so that's what SIMS does. The issues around consent of these enslaved patients is not really one that historians of medicine have taken up or even slavery. That tends to be a 21st century issue because enslaved people, are not considered human beings legally in the United States in the 1840s. They're movable property. You don't ask a slave for consent because a slave cannot give consent. And so you ask consent of the owners. And that's what he did when he leased out those slaves. And Sims writes in his memoir that in fact, he has a hospital built for himself after he canvasses the county uh, and this is right outside of Montgomery for cases. He gets a little over half a dozen cases. So the second fiction I wanted to revise in this kind of revisionist history was the fact that the first hospital for women was based in New York. That was literally on historical markers and encyclopedias. And as a historian who wanted to, who wanted to center the enslaved women and really bring that story out, I thought, wait, this man wrote in his memoir that the first hospital he ever had built for women, the treatment of women's diseases, was this hospital for enslaved people in Mount Meigs, Alabama. In fact, this is a, a picture of it in 1895 after he had sold it to a former surgical assistant. It was still being used as a Negro hospital even after slavery ended. And even though this is a really grainy image, there are three black folk in this picture, a little child to my far left in the corner. There's a woman right above him, uh, above the child who is washing uh, laundry and an older man in the center of the picture, uh, right behind the bush sitting on the porch. So it was still being used as a hospital to treat black people, even in the 1890s. And so I was very intentional, first paragraph, first sentence of my book, I say the first hospital for women in this country was founded on a slave farm. And this is literally from Sims's own writings in his memoir. And during his experimental time, he literally perfects the, um, he perfects the speculum, right? Where he uses two pewter spoons um, to get, as he says, a better view of the upper vaginal area on an enslaved woman. It later becomes known as the Sims speculum. He uh, calls the lithotomy position the Sims position. And all of this is happening on the bodies of these women. After about two years, Sims cannot seem to, to fix them or cure them. And so the white surgical assistants withdraw their support. They leave. The white community is also quite critical, they withdraw their support. And Sims then teaches his patients, right? These half dozen women to assist him as nurses and surgical assistants. And in 1849, he finally, with their assistance, right, creates this, this, as he writes, creates a cure for this most loathsome uh, condition. And so what happens, right? Sims becomes, really well known after this. He founds the Women's Hospital in New York in 1855. And almost all of the articles that are printed afterwards, even the commemorative articles printed around Sims, there is literally an erasure of his slave patients. Um, and this erasure happens largely through the illustrations. The nurses become white, the patients become white, they become clothed. And several years later, right, 
you have this idea that somehow Sims does this, right, on white patients in New York. And there is a kind of effacing of the historical record that this happened with enslaved patients. And in fact, most of the advances in uh, gynecology happened in the South and it happened because these men had access or the hospitals even had access to slave patients. And so what is the legacy that we're faced with? This is also another image uh, of the kind of erasure of slave patients through the illustrations in medical journals. This is of the um, former surgical assistant who he sold the hospital to, who becomes a, a vociferous critic of Sims. But the, the legacy that's left, right, from the 19th century to the 21st century is, and this is one that I, it's not hyperbolic, right? In fact, there's evidence. I wrote an article with Charlotte Fett in the American Journal of Public Health, where you can see the citation. Literally, the stats for Black women in the country today, in 2020, are about the same as the 19th century during the age of slavery. And so here I am talking to you all in an OBGYN department, and you know the stats, right? We are in a maternal crisis facing Black women and Black birthing people. The national stats, Black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than white women. Um, in certain urban spaces like New York, the number goes as high as eight times. In rural spaces, there are often no OBGYN wards or departments. The place where I grew up in high school, uh, Williamsburg County in South Carolina, literally has not had a maternity ward since 1990. That's when I graduated high school. If you wanna have a baby, uh, you better have access to transportation so that you can go to the next county or the next small city, uh, Florence, South Carolina, which is about 40 miles away. And so here we are in a space where in freedom, the stats haven't changed. And in fact, there's less of an effort, right, by the state. Um, unfortunately, the numbers show by many medical institutions and practitioners um, to really have these patients, these people have the same quality of care and life as white patients. And so, if there is a legacy of all of those men that I've named, of all of those medical practices, it would be the kind of um, fictions that still exist, unfortunately, in some of the textbooks and some of the trainings, um, but also the ways in which um, these stats have really been unchanging over the course of nearly 150 years. So I thank you. I am open to your questions or comments. I do apologize for the... Um, I do apologize for the um, delay earlier this morning. Thank you very much. That was uh, really, um, you know, an amazing, uh, amazing talk and uh, review of this this really important history. And and I learned some things. Some of what you said was different than what I've read in other. So I think in 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 terms of the detail of Sims's history, for example, I didn't know about that hospital um, in in the South, and um, I think that's really interesting. And and as I'm listening to you through your talk, I'm be, I'm wondering. I start out thinking you're not a fan of Dr. Sims, and then I'm thinking, oh, maybe she is a fan of Dr. Sims, <laughs> and then a back a circle of full, full around, given the way you, you presented the history. So um, really appreciate your perspective. Um, really, I don't really have a specific question except to, to, to um, just give you a kudos for the great presentation. Thank you so um, much. Yeah, I've often gotten the, um, I try and stay away from you know, defending him. There's already a school of folk. Um, they're pretty small in number in the history of the medicine world who feel he needs defense. And I'm like, he was a elite, you know, wealthy, famous man. He doesn't need anybody to defend him in the 21st century. Um, you know, so right. And I think that that when you're um, talking about his not using opioids for his surgery, you've made the, a very important point that we as 
obstetrician gynecologists know about constipation. In some renditions, though, that is says that he deliberately withheld it for the surgery, but then gave it to them after the surgery. So they actually become addicted to help to, to make them want to stay on his, in the time where he had several women slaves, girls, some of them girls. Um, so they stayed there in part because they had little choices, you've already pointed out, but in part because they actually got them addicted to steroids. And in one of the books I read, it even said that he, on his white women, he treated them with opioids during the surgery and in black not. I don't know if that was is true or not. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, um, they, this is the thing where I said a lot of folk who have written and I, I've read exactly what you're talking about. And I know that person, he does yeah. not really understand the history of slavery. Um, if you rent out anything, right? So whether it's a car, you know, today's age, a car, an apartment, um, you rent out your services as a temp, right? You're the, the, it's a contract that binds you. And so these women couldn't just leave. They were owned. Uh, you know, I mean, Sims doesn't own them outright. He has leased them from their owners. And the only person who is able to say they can leave before the contract is up is their owners. So whether they're addicted or not has no bearing on, on their, their own positionality because they're movable property. And so as long as they are under his contractual care, right? Um, what they think, what they do, doesn't it, it doesn't matter legally, right? Um, and so that's the nature of slavery. What I do think is interesting, though, and I often joke, it's something that I call this kind of racial cognitive dissonance. So if we think about the ways that during the 19th century, women were considered a subset of men, somehow women's, um, you know, because of the, the nerves, um, the sensitive nerves in their uteri that control their brain. <laughs> in their, co their cognition. That was the thought process back then. So here you have women, Black people who were biologically inferior, according to the science of the day, they lived in a state of arrested intellectual development. And yet here he teaches these women who are, who are enslaved women, who are illiterate, the same skills as his white male surgical assistants. And I often joke, it's only when he has this team of assistants does he actually come up with a successful <laughs> reparative surgery, right? So the racial, cog cogn you know, racial cognitive dissonance that I call it is that even though here he is teaching these women the same thing that these literate white men um, learn from him, nobody is willing to kind of go against the racial etiquette of the day and say, wait, how can you teach these people who are incapable, supposedly, of learning these things? How can you teach them? So what you do is you just write down what people believe, even though what you've described is the very opposite. It goes into why experiment on Black women to ultimately cure all women. And what that meant in the 19th century was essentially white women, if there was a biological difference, because he knows that a Black woman's cervix looks just like a white woman's cervix. But, you know, this is the kind of racial dissonance that goes on, right? The kind of cognitive dissonance that goes on, that we tend to ignore what's written because of this embrace of an of a ideology. Um, there was one time, and I'll be quiet after this, where he writes, you know, that one of the enslaved women lost sense of herself and needed to be restrained even more. And for me, I'm thinking, why does one need to be restrained if they don't experience pain? It would seem they would be the easiest experimental patients to have because you don't have to worry about restraining them like other patients. But here you are literally looking at this writing, right? And I'm having to read between the lines to say, there's something that doesn't add up, right? And so once you center a patient's perspective, and in particular, Black women's perspective in this kind of history, it can provide you with all kinds of insights that have been, you know, traditionally overlooked. Yeah, those are those are great points. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have a comment or a question for Dr. Owens? I do. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Lisa. I'm one of the residents here at Cedars. Thank you so much for your talk this morning. Um, I just have a kind of a quick question and point. You had said that uh, your quote that struck me is, in freedom, the stats have not changed. Yeah. And here in 2020, 
um, like we have all this medical knowledge, we have this background that you have beautifully um, laid out for us. Like, what do we do now? Like, how do we make these stats change? How do we change our narrative? I, I know mm-hmm. it's a loaded question and you likely don't have the answer because I think a lot of us don't, but I just, like, what do we do? How do we change that? Thank you for that, Lisa. Um, you know, it's interesting. I have a lot of these conversations and I think for many of us, I, I often say this, what are, what are some of the things that we're taught as five-year-olds in kindergarten? We are taught to respect people and treat them equally. I mean, at the core of it, when someone enters into a space where there, there is hierarchy, and so just by the very nature of medicine and academia as well, People talk to us um, in a certain way because we have titles that precede our names and afterwards, right? So there's MD after yours, doctor before yours, there's doctor before mine, PhD before mine. So there's already an imbalance of power. There is certain jargon that you understand that the patient doesn't understand. So I would say a kind of accessibility means that you are now making a concerted effort to, to treat that person equally. The other thing is, I don't even think there needs to be retraining because white women and birthing people are not suffering the same consequences. We know it's not because the patient is white or black. It's because of the mechanism of racism, right? Or an anti-blackness that, that permeates that. So it's not because somebody's black and pregnant that that means that there's a, a greater risk because of something biological. What it means is, because of the enduring legacy, unfortunately, of anti-Blackness, there are going to be folk who believe in that person's, their inferior, uh, excuse me, inferiority. So I tend to to, to, uh, use one of the most recent research studies that comes out of the University of Virginia. And I like to pick on the University of Virginia because I did my postdoc there. (laughs) So, you know, so people can't say, ah, she's being biased. I'm like, no, I, I did my postdoc there. The University of Virginia's medical school, as you all know, one of the most elite medical institutions to get into in the country, publishes a study in 2016 based on 2014 research. In sampling, uh, I'm sorry, surveying a sample of 266 medical residents and students, they found overwhelmingly that these white medical residents and students believed that black people's blood coagulated more than white people. Black people had thicker skin. Black people were more addicted to illegal narcotics. Black people, especially black women, didn't experience pain. And so this is not in 1814 or not, ni- or not even 1914. This is in 2014, the 21st century. How in the world are these people who are beating out thousands of applicants to come to one of the most elite institutions in the United States. How do they believe this? They've learned this at home. They've learned it from society. And you can literally say to people, Black people statistically and historically have, have used less illegal narcotics than other ethnic groups. And you can show them right? The studies that come from the CDC, the government, Harvard, all of these places, and people will not believe you because there is an enduring belief in the inferiority and the pathology of Black people. And so what I say is treat your patients with respect, period. Do not be condescending. Do not be patronizing. Um, And the, the kind of, you know, his, you know, I, I call it the petty historian side of me believes that there needs to be something punitive that happens to people. Because if I continuously mistreated my students and I continually got really bad student evaluations, if I continually flaunt my students or tried to date them or assaulted them, I wouldn't have a job and I'd probably be sued. And so how do these stats continue without something punitively happening where people are suffering the consequences of their actions? Um, In the afterword of my book, I talk about having two cervical dilations and never receiving anesthesia for it. And literally having this person bore a hole into my cervix. I had cervical stenosis during my IVF, I discovered that. And not giving me anesthesia at all. And this wasn't an intentionally mean person, But I remember after the first time and I I screamed out for 15 minutes, he said, oh, I didn't think it would hurt that bad. 
That was in 2016. So I think we need to treat people with respect and, and recognize that these kinds of these kinds of courses um, are important. Kim, do you have a comment? Kim, and then Ken, and then Ken. Kim, go first. Um, Dr. Owens, that was amazing, and I really appreciate your due diligence. Um, what what advice do you have to? Because this is a great medical history lecture, right? And the whole world is interested in this right now. What advice do you have for us who are training people to rewrite what we teach them about this history? I mean, do we put it, you know, is it the medical school and we start putting it into the books there? Where is it that we put it so that this doesn't just become a one-off thing that happened back in 2020? Yeah. Um, I know for me, I've been doing a lot of work with um, medical institutions and organizations to help change the curriculum. Um, curriculum development is important. I think for, for me, at least, I recognize as someone who is um, a director of a medical humanities program, I know that the intersections of the humanities is really important. Often there's a focus on STEM. Um, and I often say, you know, we don't exist, no field exists in a bubble. Um, and so just as I'm informed by medicine, um, I'm informed by political science and statistics in the past, right? Medicine can also be informed by other fields. Um, I do think that cultural core competencies um, may need to also be assessed. Sometimes it's a reteaching of certain stereotypes <laughs> that are not very helpful. Um, you know, so I think it's well-intentioned, but sometimes the cultural sensitivities can border into a misinformation. Um, and so ultimately, I, I think that there needs to be um, an integration of um, people in the communities that you serve on boards, not just a, t a racial diversity task force. I understand the boards are here to, to raise money, but wouldn't it also be nice to be more inclusive of the communities that hospitals are serving and have some of those voices included in the decision making processes as those are the people who who are, who are utilizing uh, the institution and that you all are serving. Um, you know, so those are, are some of, of the things, but it's, as you said, um, people have short, short term memories <laughs> around these issues and there'll be something else that comes up and kind of reproductive justice issues and birthing justice issues will then kind of take another space, but you just have to keep, even in that little space where it might be minimized a little bit more, you just keep plugging away. Um, and changing legislation, changing textbooks, speaking out, um, incorporating uh, a lot of the things that have been happening um, within this field over the past three to five years. Thanks. By the way, that's Dr. Kim Gregory, who's never afraid to speak out. It's not Morgan McKay. I don't know why you have more, it says Morgan Kim, but anyway, so Ken, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, um echo what you were saying and make a comment. Um, having moved here from the deep south, Alabama, just two months ago, mm -hmm. it's a very pervasive culture and atmosphere there. And it's a palpable difference coming here compared to there. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. It, it, it's, it, there's so many OBGYN offices there that, um, and physicians that revere J. Marion Sims. There's multiple offices that have his picture um, and so it's a pervasive attitude um, uh, that they, they believe and hold him as the, the grandfather of OBGYN and all of the faults and shortcomings and inequities are minimized. Um, and it's a total pervasive cultural attitude in the deep south that when you're a medical student, a resident, a fellow, and you're surrounded by that, um, you're made to believe, and sometimes, um, you, you know, if, if you don't go with the grain, then you're sequestered into this other category um, and you're, you're, you're segregated off to kind of the main body of the culture. Um, so I think, especially in those pockets in, Miss we have an office in Mississippi also, um, um, where it's just a stark contrast um, and, the stories I could tell are are insane that you would you would believe them because you you know but it's, it's a similar history that people know the women's hospital in the south all the things that happened but but 
to this day, there is just a pervasive cultural attitude that is that is not um, really changing, or if it is, it's changing at a yeah. really unfortunately slow pace. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, it's it, so I would say, as someone who grew up in South Carolina, literally across the street, my high school was across the street from a cotton field. Our mascot was called a golden bow weevil. I, t I left Los Angeles because I got my PhD from UCLA, left off Los Angeles to go to UVA, which revered Mr. Jefferson, right? <laughs> go to Ole Miss for five years where I taught. And then when the book blows up, I know you, sh you even shook your head at Ole Miss. Uh, let me tell you, I felt like I ran to freedom <laughs> when I went to New York. And I say that as someone who is a Southerner and loves the South, but it the upper South and the deep South were, were very different. Um, but I, I do say this, I have a, a little bit of hope. I have given talks to, you would be surprised, the deeply Southern white groups, sons of the Confederate veterans, the daughters of the American Revolution. That was in uh, Memphis for the SCV, Mississippi for the daughters of the American Revolution. I've given two talks um, in Alabama, one at the College of Charleston where the James Marion Sims Society came. And you could tell they were angry. I mean, they had their hands folded. And then after the talk, they came and they said, well, you know, I hadn't really thought about it in that way. I think you did a fair presentation. And so I said, well, good, go on and buy my books. And then you all can use it as a book club reading right, for, for your next society meeting. But there was a way, I think, I do incorporate humor. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to change their philosophical leanings towards still trying to, to hold Sims up in a particular light. And that's their business, not mine. But what I can do is at least say, I, I have documented this based on the vetting process. And that if you say you care about all Southerners, then that means you got to care about the entirety of the South. And that includes those enslaved folk that were experimented on. And you also must contend with the legacy of what happens to their descendants. And so for that, they never have an answer. And so I commend you just for, for, for being down there so long. <laughs> well, I mean, it's funny that you say that, that Virginia is like, not like, cause my wife is a physician here also. And we, we I, almost every day we comment on the stark difference and we're much happier here. But it's, it's funny because when we, we were at UNC before, out in between Alabama, between training and getting recruited back, but we, we referred to that and Virginia as the shallow South. And then we went back to the deep where it's just completely different. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's just the culture. It's at football games. It's when you're tailgating. Um, but I will say, like, to kind of change it, they, they recruited the, the University of Alabama football team and Nick Saban. They, they have coaches. And Nick Saban, um, for all his curiosities, um, he's been trying to further that message because obviously his whole team is very diverse, um, um, which is fascinating because in a culture where they return football also, that's kind of a way around trying to get the message to all the, the older institutions and the, the, the cultural attitudes. So thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Kim, for that that uh, football, ending on a football point, the boys. Okay. Um, <laughs> but thank you, Dr. Owens. That was fabulous. I just want you to know that um, you know, now that we're doing things on Zoom, we get a count of how many people are on. And we had a hit a high day today of 78. So I think uh, for this, our, just our usual Grand Rounds time period. So we, we, we owe that to you. And thank you very much. And it was really a, a fabulous talk. Really Thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.